Geopolitics and Empire is joined by Jonathan J. Kui, who's a biologist and founder of GigaOmBiological.com. Welcome to Geopolitics and Empire, Jay. Hey, thank you very much for having me. Wow, it's a, it's a real pleasure. Yeah, and thanks for coming on. Uh, I, I've been following your work for quite a while, and you gave a, 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 an amazing talk a couple of weeks ago on your Twitch. Uh, link is in the description, two and a half hour talk. And I think you're really getting close to what's been going on with uh, COVID. I've been trying to get to the bottom of Operation COVID-1984, as I call it. And uh, again, I was, I was blown away by your nuanced attempt at trying to explain it's and as I was telling you before the interview, uh, I conducted the first interview with the Bioweapons Act author Francis Boyle in January of 2020. You know, his thesis that the crown virus is a bio warfare weapon that leaked from the lab. Uh, you know, my interview went viral, got deleted. Uh, the Associated Press wrote a hit piece on us. And I've also interviewed people like Denis Rancor uh, in Quebec, who's I, I love his work as well. And he says there's no evidence of a virus. My view has always been that COVID, whatever COVID is, Operation COVID was a manufactured and planned uh, event, given so many pandemic simulations being carried out, and that it was either a, a sort of low-level bioweapon release or there was not a virus. You know, it was just a manufactured false flag. I'm not a no-viruser, uh, and I also never believed that we were in a pandemic uh, by definition or, or in any real danger. And so um, maybe if you could just lay out your thesis for us lay people as to, you know, what you think, uh, you know, what in the heck has been and is still going on with uh, COVID. Um, well, thanks. First of all, let me applaud you for being in the minority of people who were brave enough to still apply common sense in the face of a, me a media barrage, which suggested that we had no previous experience that we could apply to this new situation. And um, it has taken me really an extraordinary length of time to awaken to which parts of this are biologically plausible and which parts are not, simply because, like most of us were, some aspect of this narrative became too seductive to disregard and figured into our our interpretation of reality for a very, very long time, a series of assumptions that were put into our heads by social media and, and TV news, and also just intuition led us to these assumptions, right? And, and some of the, the most extraordinary changes are happening behind the scenes among, you know, learned people. Um, you're not going to see this on TV, but there is a huge group of individuals, of biologists, of doctors, chemists, lawyers, that are all becoming aware of this cognitive dissonance that we've all been engaged in much longer than from 2020. But there was a, a sort of exponential rise in the disconnect between what we knew before the pandemic and what we apparently know now. And the the answers to all those questions were, of course, monopolized by those people on TV. And it was that monopolization of the narrative which made it very seductive to see the leaked information as evidence of the real crime. And so most of us were led along this, you know, mystery solving, sleuthing thing where the conclusion, the only conclusion you could come to was that they were covering up the fact that this must be a, a lab leak. And, and if you then tried to apply that new revelation to the TV data, what you came up with was, for most people, what you would come up with is, oh my gosh, this is a disaster. <laughs> A kind of Chernobyl, you know, lost control. It's it's mankind's hubris, which has brought us to the brink of of total elimination because these people have no respect for nature. And I think it it was being challenged a number of times over the last two years to try and understand the the group or the mindset that you mentioned earlier, which is this no virus mindset. It's a large actually a very umbrella term to describe people who are in any range of skeptical about allopathic medicine and the Western model of disease. Um, it doesn't mean necessarily that you don't believe in the current child vaccine schedule. It could just mean that you believe that water has memory 
Um, there, it's a really amorphous group of people that inevitably somewhere along the line gets connected to completely ridiculous science. And so for me, it was very difficult to, to grasp how it was that there were some people that were very sharp that were on this no virus side that seemed to be able to apply a pretty sharp level of scrutiny to certain aspects of the pandemic, but then completely not to any, just willy nilly discounting, you know, 60 years of biology to make their point or to sell their book. And so I've, you know, I've had clashes or bumped heads with people on our side because I'm, I want to listen to them. I want to understand what it is about their, their objections to the pandemic narrative that are okay and, and give them ground to stand on. And it, it was in exploring their interpretations of the isolation papers, their interpretations of the meta sequencing papers that led me to start to think about and realize that, wow, so much of what we know about coronavirus is actually not done from wild harvested coronaviruses, but from sequences that were detected in the wild and then replicated in a DNA cloning technology form. And so to make it as simple as possible for people who are listening, an RNA virus copies itself in your cells and that copying process because it is a it is a rna based process it has many more errors that can occur um than when dna is replicated for example when a bacteria copies its genome and then and then makes copies of itself by division um by splitting that that kind of replication is much higher fidelity and so that results in in a in a a loose collection of virons that are genetically very closely related to one another, but can have point mutations, which are often not advantageous. And that results in coronaviruses being very difficult to grow in culture. They're very difficult to isolate in the wild. Um, because again, there's something about the way that the coronavirus replicates and we still don't understand it. That's part of the argument that I'm making. We still don't understand fully how a coronavirus manages to replicate its giant genome with such high fidelity, despite the fact that it's using RNA. That's part of the reason why a lot of these no virus people are constantly attacking the sequencing part, because they would argue that somewhere in here, they're, they're implying a fidelity that they can't have because viruses don't, they don't even go that far. They just say that they can't have this fidelity, but in in trying to nail down what we know and don't know about coronavirus. Um, I noticed a video in April of 2021 where a guy by the name of Robert Malone is explaining a coronavirus infection. And he made this statement that the there is a large majority of the particles that are made during replication, which are replication incompetent. And the reason why the replication is incompetent is because during the assembly of their genome or the copying of their genome, and it's not really clear which is which, there are possibilities where the bare minimum amount of genetic material, the requisite genes that are required to replicate in the next cell aren't present. And surprisingly, in the few ways that they've tried to measure this, it does seem that it's a quite large proportion of the virons that are produced aren't actually fully equipped to replicate. And so this is a very different model of infection than what the PBS NewsHour or Bill Gates would tell you that you're infected with a Delta variant and all the variants that come out of your mouth are Delta variant virus. As instead, a lot of the variants that come out of your mouth can't copy in the next cell that they're going because they're missing genes. And so this is a different form, but part of the total swarm of viruses that's in somebody when they're when they're infected. It's not only a genetic swarm of closely related viruses due to the way that RNA replicates, but it's also a collection of misassembled or partially complete genomes that result in non-transmissibility for those particles.
Also, if you need health insurance that covers you wherever you may roam, check out my friend James Guzman's Borderless Health Insurance. One of the great things about living internationally is saving money on health care, but private care overseas can be expensive. Go to borderlesshealthinsurance.com to watch a short presentation on expat and digital nomad health care and sign up for a free consultation to review your options. Just to recap then, so what you're saying is that there, you know, there are these infect, there is this infectious disease or virus going on, but it's just, it's so weak. It's not really um, a threat because they're like bad copies coming out. Is that sort of what you're saying? I'm saying that, yes, the, the natural manifestation of a coronavirus is significantly less dangerous because of the way it manifests genetically. That is completely avoided when one, like Ralph Barrick, started in 2002 or a little bit earlier. We were doing it with other viruses, but it took a while for the molecular techniques to all coalesce where we could do such a genome as large as a coronavirus. But before that, we'd done it with smaller viruses. But essentially around the year 2002 or so, it became possible to make cDNA constructs, which were large enough to contain the whole genome of an RNA virus. The advantage being that you can copy DNA very high fidelity. So if you took that DNA and you made many copies of it by either expressing it in a vaccinia virus, which is one of the ways they do it nowadays, or grow it in a bacterial culture where you in, you incorporate it into a bacterial plasmid so that when the bacteria grows, it's just making copies of your virus or uh, DNA then later you can harvest that DNA from the bacteria and cut out that part of the virus that you want. That little piece of cDNA then perfectly encodes your virus in a DNA form, and you have as many copies as you care to make. Now you can take that cDNA in any number of ways by putting it into a viral culture, or sorry, a cell culture, or even I would imagine there would be commercial ways to just add a transcriptase to it so that you could convert the DNA to RNA. But if you copy that DNA into RNA, the RNA that you make will be a pure, perfect copy of the RNA of the virus that you started with to make the cDNA. And every copy that you make from the cDNA will be a perfect copy. And that's very different than what would happen if you took that RNA and you let it copy itself using RNA-dependent RNA polymerase from the virus. And that difference means that in a dish, in a laboratory, I can create a pure infectious clone version of something that I saw a shadow of in the wild and compare that clone to another clone of a different shadow that someone found in a cave in Wuhan. And then those clones will definitely grow in a cell culture and definitely produce plaques they will definitely produce enough rna for it to be detected with pcr for it to be neutralized by antibodies all of the kinds of in vitro experiments are completely doable if you start with a clone because you will have sufficient infectious rna to have anything start to begin with if you rely on this natural form of the coronavirus and you try to grow it in a 96 well plate, maybe only eight of those wells will ever produce a plaque. And so then you have to start with those and each of those will be different and they will change as they move. So if you send it to your friend in Ottawa, what you sent to him will be different than what you use in your laboratory because it's copying itself. It's changing all the time. Whereas if you start with that clone from the freezer every time, then you can send it to your friend in Ottawa. He's always starting at the same place you are. And that sounds like a wonderful thing from the perspective of learning how these things work and being able to, to, to do experiments that are comparable to one. It makes sense scientifically, except you're making a purity of these viruses that cannot, does not ever exist in nature. And therefore, you're creating a kind of risk that isn't gain of function. It's just, it's just different. It's like you're studying uranium under a microscope. You study uranium with a bunch of different measuring tools. Oh, no, I would like to make it highly pure and then pressurize it until it explodes. Well, that's a different kind of study. And I would argue that if coronavirus requires you to make a clone in order to study it, it may be that's too dangerous of a form. And we need to find other ways or other ways of monitoring it. But 
the concept that you could go into, and this is the key, the concept that you could go into a bat cave and get really unlucky every thousand years and bring back a pandemic is completely wrong. The idea that someone could go to a bat cave, collect a virus, and grow a little bit in a laboratory and have it go around the world is false because of the nature of a coronavirus RNA swarm. But if you made enough of it, you could easily infect a city. You could easily create a spread which for a very brief period of time, because of the purity, could move from person to person with extreme symptoms, could move from a point release in Wuhan to Italy and to Washington State and to a couple other places, and for a very brief period of time, be very impressive and move in a way that was hard to describe. Because again, remember, it's starting out pure and then being carried around at a viral load and a purity that never, ever would have existed if it was a person really coming out of a bat cave and getting off a train in Wuhan and going to the market. This is kind of sounding then like my... Uh original you know i i don't have a definitive theory i think this is the you know scientific process we hold these different hypotheses and we're trying to figure out which one is making the more sense over time with new information and that it's kind of like a, a low level bioweapon i mean people say absolutely, if, if absolutely. They, people argue that oh if they wanted to create a bioweapon then this is the worst bioweapon ever i mean you can create different you know categories I mean, or, there are or, or people payloads. Just to give a shout out, there's a person by the name of Kevin McCarran who's been arguing this exact thing from the beginning. The best bioweapon is not even that lethal. It is a the the one of the arguments you could make is, for example, if this bioweapon made everyone who got infected with it have pink dots, we would know right away who had it. We would track it very easily, and there would be no way to weaponize that except for with the red dots, right? But this didn't have that. This had an extra layer of you don't know if you have it or not, because the only way you could know is to test, because asymptomatically it was there. There were levels of this ghost that heretofore just have not existed before. The concept that someone could be asymptomatically infected with a virus, and that was a significant point of data before 2020 is ne was never done. Um, and that was a, a, a system-wide, um, across the globe, adopted standard, um, which allowed them to really invert how we think about all-cause mortality and focus on one cause, which is just impossible. Um, but what you're saying, and what Kevin McCarran has been arguing for a long time, is that a virus that doesn't kill very many people, but's trackable, and is accompanied by the right kind of of messaging could have easily set a, a scenario where you know if even if you just make a bunch of people sick and overload the hospitals but don't kill anyone that could be a pretty effective bioweapon but even worse if you could just get people to panic and think that's happening um and and that's where this becomes i think quite quite frightening because then you need to start being introspective from the American side and wonder at what point have we realized that, wow, we really went overboard here. We might have made, it might have gone overboard and no one seems to realize that yet. No one seems, they just keep adding more numbers to how many people died from COVID. And they keep saying that we need to go forward with this plan because this is working. Um, and that's what frightens me the most because at this stage, the Scooby-Doo should be over if it's really China against America. Um, because we should have said, whoa, man, they fooled us. I thought this was going to be a lot worse than it was. And now we got to get our act together and start, uh, you know, improving the average American's health with better nutrition and this kind of thing. But no, nothing, nothing like that is happening right now. So well, now, yeah. now, now it becomes much more frightening, but I would agree just to circle back that, um, that the the implications of of my current thinking are that it would require very little actual on the ground viral dying and viral sickness accompanied with a very beautiful highly orchestrated campaign 
of what not to do, which is don't use any antibiotics. You have no idea what to do. Nothing will work and do that around the globe. You could get the same result. Um, and that's, what's frightening. Yeah. And, and then to get your, so I'm, I'm with you so far, it's making, um, sense, but then was this act for me, it seems it was all planned and intentional because you can sort of see this arc, as you said, we're still in it. And, uh, it's like a low level, let's say bioweapon and, it's everyone's on board us china it seems like um you know it's all countries versus their own populations because i've had guests on who said you know it's a it's a u.s bioweapon against china and iran others who have said it was a you know russian chinese bioweapon against the west Uh, but it seems like everyone uh is on board and then they're applying this sort of biomedical security state this biosecurity regime against us and um just just your thoughts on where is this coming from where, where is this a- emanating from where's the power center be- behind what's going uh, on i mean i i gotta say man this is the million dollar question i think you, you're nailing it on the head because um at some point it's my feeling that everyone was fooled and so it's just a question of when when I, I, I we could all still be fooled. I think that's probably the best bet at this stage to still put your chips on that. But but um, for me, it feels like a double cross. So I, I, I could try to explain it, but essentially it feels like a double cross. Um, imagine a scenario where where. America and USAID and EcoHealth Alliance were trying to set up a a trail of publications and ideas, which made it seem like um, America wasn't going to weaponize coronavirus because we were smart enough. We put a ban on it, but America didn't because we did it over there um, and we published papers with them over there. So it's not like we really hit it at all. And and. The Chinese could have seen it coming, right? The Chinese could have easily seen this coming and said, sure, we'll do your experiments for you. We'll open that lab for you. And then at some point, I don't know when the play started, but whenever the play started, um, now we're seeing the two sides, you know, reacting to realizing that, whoops, we didn't fool them. And whose whoops, we didn't fool them, I don't really know. But that's what this feels like. It feels like a double cross. and somewhere everybody's still stuck on their bluff waiting for the other side to crack or waiting for the other side to make a mistake or 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 maybe there was a yeah i I don't know how to speculate beyond that but it feels much more like a double cross than it does china versus the west or something like this which i think is was at some point a very seductive you know very seductive uh narrative but i just don't think it fits the the complications up until this stage because the west is not behaving that way and and the east is not behaving this way and and all the players in between are are seeming to go along somehow in a very yeah it's very very dubious to me i mean we're not even talking about ukraine or all this other nonsense that's going on in the world that i can't pay attention to because it's too unrelated to the biology but it just feels it feels very much like an intended amount of swamp. Yeah, and um, again, for me, um, one of the biggest issues is the whole, I call it the algorithm ghetto, the biomedical security state, the QR codes, the digital passports. And when I ask myself, you know, what's the real end game here? You know, the classic qui bono who benefits. I mean, if there was no pandemic um, threat, as you said, it's like a low level, let's say flu or whatever, over time it just dissipates. Um, but the consequences of everything that's going on, it seems to be pretty much them planning to lock us down, um, forever, you know, putting into a prison, putting us into a, a prison planet. You got lockdowns that they're, they're putting into law permanently. Um, these digital ID, digital passports, that are, it's going to control at a minute level, um, everything, whether you can buy or sell, whether you can uh, work, whether you can travel, not just internationally, but between states in your own country, even here in Mexico, where I am, Mexican governors have proposed internal Soviet passports where, you know, I, I, I supposedly I wouldn't be able to leave my state or enter if I didn't have a vaccine certificate. They're talking about changing the state constitution um, to make mandatory uh, 
injections. So just y- your thought on this aspect. I mean, I-, I think all of this is mostly about establishing a global dis- sort of dystopian surveillance state for population control. But there's also elements of depopulation. Uh, you know, if you want to comment on the control as well as the adverse effects of the Pentagon juice, as I like to call it, the DARPA gene uh, therapy. So I think that the the overarching idea here is, you know, I don't know how old you are. I'm 51. Um, or am I 51? I'm going to be 51 in January. Um, the 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 overarching idea here is to convince the young adults that they themselves, and more importantly, their children. Um, should be genetically and and biologically monitored for their whole lives in, a, in an effort to collect the data necessary to make the next medical advance, which is this idea that we're going to make medicine just for you, um, tailored to your genome, which the FDA can never check because it's made just for you and we don't need to have any more monitoring of production of medicine ever again. Um, and I think that this starts with, first of all, you know, getting rid of this idea that you have any say over what goes into your body. If the the state decides that everybody's required to be transfected, then everybody's going to be transfected. And that, I think, was already demonstrated with the college kids who are in, in America, where I am, the only people really, besides some old folk, um, wearing masks are college kids. And it's extraordinary how many college kids are wearing masks at their day job when they're at a restaurant or at a coffee shop or something like that. The whole place has no masks except for that person um, between the age of like 20 and 24. And those are the people that were targeted for complete submission. I mean, they had to take all the shots, do all the testing, isolate whenever they were, uh, Whenever they were positive, they had to wear their masks in all their classes and on all their campuses. And and so this level of, of submission is not going to be let go. I mean, they might l- relax it for a little bit, but it, it seems almost inevitable because I really do think that this is the deal. Um, they can't. They can't depopulate us because they have not collected the data that's here. And I made this um, point on other podcasts, but if you think about the idea that the biological models and also the, you know, the, the depopulation mythology suggests that 10 billion people is already way too much. We might peak at 11 billion, but we need to go down much lower. And the numbers are anywhere from 500 million to 2 billion people. But anyway, you cut it. The amount of diversity, the amount of, if I can use this term without sounding like a racist, but the number of mixed breed humans that are on the planet right now, which represent unique genetic assortments, which have the potential to be correlated with a unique medical history, which if you think about it like a go game or a chess game are individual instances of the human game then in order to teach an AI how to win at the human game, you need as many instances of the human game as possible, as many genomes correlated to as much phenotypic medical data as possible. And that data needs to be collected before any AI will ever be able to win. And so even though that AI might not exist, a lot of these transhumanist people that are running the secret meetings in the background understand this from a 3,000 or 30,000 foot level that without that data, no AI is going to figure out anything. So they need to get data from babies, like genetic data from babies, and then all the all the medical data from that kid's life, uh, ideally, and as many of them as possible. And so this is a, it's a multi, definitely a multi-year plan to try and remodel the way we think about our stewardship of our bodies and and the stewardship of our children. Um, and so it's not going to, they're not going to get us. They're not going to get me or, or any of us. They're trying to get our kids to buy into that idea. Um, and I, I really, I feel that in my heart. I think that's why they went so hard on the college kids this last couple of years. Yeah. And I, I would agree with you. you. You've mentioned that in previous talks. I mean, it's also one factor is this transhuman, uh, transhumanist, uh, idea that these elites have. And, you know, they want an Elysium. They want immortality. I think that 
they truly believe that they can do it. It's it's the you know it's the age old um, you know a- alchemy thing. Uh, I think you know Ray. I've read Ray Kurzweil takes two hundred pills a day supplements because he, he's hoping to remain alive until you know this singularity comes. I think it's fantasy. I don't think it's possible. What what, what do you think? I, I would agree with you without a doubt. Um, I think that from what I find very interesting, a little microcosm of this is that before I, I lost my job as an academic biologist, I was a neurobiologist. And that meant that I worked on uh, microscopes and, and brain slices of my, mice. Um, but it also meant that I read all of this, this neuroscience stuff. And I've met all these people and talked to them and looked at their experiments and read their papers. Sometimes I even reviewed them. Um, and I, so I'm keenly aware of where the cutting edge is in neuroscience in terms of how we monitor circuits, how we can perturb them and, 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 and see how they work. And of course, you're probably aware we, we analyze more than just human brains. We work on primate brains and insect brains and small mammals like rats and ferrets and mice and, and everything in between for anatomy and also for behavior. There are people who work on bat brains for behavior, for example. So this idea of, of monitoring n- neuronal messaging, neuronal circuitry, and then augmenting it with any number of of physical or chemical methodologies is what cutting edge neuroscience is all about and what what transhumanist um superhero of twitter uh and neuralink uh creator elon musk does with those pigs and those monkeys is really not that amazing and in fact from a neuroscience perspective has already been demonstrated to be something that could never be commercially used on a primate that you wanted to live for a long time because you can't make a hole in a mammal's brain and put something in there and then have the mammal live a long and healthy life afterward it's just not possible and no matter how you sterilize it or what you do to it the body will recognize it as foreign it will have infections it will cause pain it will there's just very little way to see how this could become a commercially viable human product and yet Social media and television and newspapers are promoting this as the start of of a technological revolution that will result in your phone interfacing with your brain and everybody's just going to line up to have his robot surgeon implanted and it's just all again as you said it's 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 Theranos in a sense it's like we're going to prick your blood and I'm going to tell you all the diseases you're going to get throughout your lifetime is a is a is a mythology and. And I do believe that it is very likely that much of the much of the biology that has been presented over the last three years as being crucial and vital to understand and follow by um, Fauci and these other people is largely mythology. It is largely a, an exaggeration about the natural form of coronavirus, um, and the the. The easy interpretation is, is that they're lying to you about it because they overextended and they had something leak. And now everybody has had this experience where they got sick from something that they never would have gotten sick from hadn't these people, um, hadn't these people released this virus. And what's problem with that is there's a million problems with that, but the worst one is, and the one that I try to remind everyone about it is that, can you remember when it was when you were in high school that you were the sickest most people say no i can't and i said what about in college i'm not sure and you know the fact that you can remember back to 2019 and you had a really bad painful wow i thought i was going to die only means that pathogens and respiratory viruses exist that's all it means it doesn't mean that oh of course it was a lab that's the evidence i needed it cleared it all up, but so many people, because of the way that the TV and social media has greased these wheels, that the moment they put one and two together, it's like, wow, it's it makes perfect sense. No wonder I was so sick. It was a lab virus. Gee whiz. Man, oh man. And and that 
G whiz is happening across the board. That's how you know it's wrong. It's happening on the left. It's happening on the right. It's happening all over the place. I can even find teachers at my kid's school now that will say that it's a lab virus. And that's why we've got to be extra careful still. And so this mythology works perfect for the people that are running the show. Perfect for this, for the people running the show. And I'm still trying to figure out the game because as you say, this stuff isn't po- this transhuman stuff isn't possible. So are they really dumb enough to believe it? I mean, I don't doubt some of them are drinking the Kool Aid and they're thinking and hoping that some of this stuff will work. But others, uh, you know, the elites know it's not possible. So then again, what what are they doing? Um, you know, I, I think the other shoe comes to about control for for controlling us. Um, and you you also mentioned. You know, th- thoughts on that. And and you, you've also mentioned previously, to get a little geopolitical, um, we had the whole Cold War nuclear war threat. And you talking about how they sort of want to transfer it over to, you know, the 21st century sort of new Cold War, biological war um, scare. There are people who say nuclear weapons don't exist. I don't believe in that. I, I lived in Kazakhstan for three years, uh, 120 kilometers from Seme, Semipalatinsk. Um, no, I lived in Semei, which is 120 kilometers from the Polygon, the principal nuclear so- Soviet nuclear test site, which I actually visited. I went to Ground Zero, had a ge- ge- Geiger counter, it was radioactive. And so I do think nukes exist, but I think uh, the, the idea of a nuclear winter is, is hyped. I don't necessarily believe that. I think the effects would be more localized and that we could come back from uh, a nuclear war. Um, just so, so your thoughts on the geopolitical aspect of this, you know, the biodefense industry where they want to create sort of a 21st century of the of the uh, nuclear threat, but using this stuff you've been uh, talking about, you know. Well, one of the things that I think is more most important for anyone who's just getting into this to realize is that the the study of viruses, the study of nuclear weapons and the study of radiation was all tied together under the U.S. Department of Energy back in the 50s. So one of the ideas in early biology of the clandestine portions of the American government was that radiation could be used to accelerate evolution because it causes point mutation. If we took viruses and we irradiated them, we could accelerate their evolution and essentially create new pathogens, new bioweapons, and we could also accelerate human evolution. And so for more than 10 years, there was a significant amount of black budget devoted to exploring how radiation interacts with cell cultures, animals, soldiers, etc. And then on the other side, of course, there was the development of nuclear power and nuclear weapons. But the idea that nuclear energy could be used to augment life was pursued to the end. I mean, all the way to the end on every one of these research lines before they realized that essentially they were just destroying DNA and that there was no real good laboratory model where you could use uh, use radiation effectively to to augment anything. You just kill stuff with it. But my point being here that in all of these scenarios, it it benefits the the acquisition of funding it benefits the the continued classification of this work as secret and it benefits um the governing body in general the more confusion and misunderstanding surrounds these ideas so the more we think that impending doom exists the more power these ideas have and so the the argument might be that let's say we figured out how to make a nuclear weapon and really realize that a super tiny one could already make a hole the size of new york city well we shouldn't probably tell the 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 public that because then we'll won't be able to make any nuclear weapons because they will know how dangerous they are so you would have to in a way the myth has to be controlled and you can't just tell everybody what's going on and so Just from my very simple common sense perspective, it it makes perfect sense to me that there would be nuclear weapons. That's fine with me. It also makes sense that they would be able to do things that conventional weapons, no matter how many kilotons you have, might be exceeded by these nuclear type weapons. But it would also make perfect sense to me that after they found that 
and discovered it and even proved that they could do it, they would never make 10,000 of them. They would just tell you that they did in order so that both countries could, you know, enact this kind of governance, which on the surface looks like we're going to spend more money than you on bombs until you'll stop spending money on bombs and then we'll not shoot each other because we can both destroy the world. When in reality, that doesn't really make sense. It's like saying that I'm going to protect my neighbor by buying more and more and more and more and more guns. And somehow or another, they were able to convince us that that made sense, whereas the gun argument does not. And I think that's where the gray area with nuclear weapons is. I mean, if 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 they had 100 each already, you know, we're, we're, we're talking about absurdity. And so the idea that at some point in my lifetime, there were movies made about there being, you know, an armament of 6,000 ICBMs aimed at an armament of 9,000 ICBMs and that we could destroy the earth seven or eight times over. Just it, it doesn't make logical sense, except from the perspective of making sure that everyone that heard that story and couldn't use their common sense to dispel it would be paralyzed by it. And you could do that with kids in the, in, in the school, you know, take them in the hallway and have them put their head in between their legs, um, show them a few explosions and then have Sting make a song. And now everybody thinks that the Russians, you know, are, are thinking about killing us too. And it benefited both sides. So, but, but like the no virus stance, I think it's very dangerous to say that there are no nuclear weapons. That would be even if in the end we find out that it wasn't, that we don't have any nuclear weapons, let's find that out first. Let's not start with declaring that, I think. And uh, I think with no viruses, that's the most that's the most parsimonious way to go about this. That not for 60 years, all the biologists were lying, but that a lot of the biologists were misinterpreting their data, um, were being funded to misinterpret their data, perhaps, were being discouraged from looking at alternative interpretations of their data and after 20 years or so virology was permanently at least the coronavirus wing of virology was completely distorted because it just became common to use rna infectious clone as a as a laboratory proxy and so then you can tell any story you want to um and that's what they did they they published a number of papers which laid this foundation for a the pretense that coronavirus had pandemic potential. And that you can see in all their writing. It's a story they've been trying to tell for a very long time. And all the real data points are made with RNA infectious clones. And then at some point, you know, one's gotten out. And so the Scooby-Doo story is to look back and say, well, they were already making these in 2015. Of course it was theirs without ever realizing that a coronavirus is incapable of doing it. So if a coronavirus can't do it, um, then that means at least most of the deaths weren't, weren't related to this. So the, the question now becomes, I think these are the most important questions that I'm trying to answer right now is that is the sequencing data real and how is it that it could be real, but be used against us. And I think, the best short answer I've come up for that one is, is that you just delete sequences that don't fit your narrative. Um, you don't have to add sequences. Um, you just have to select sequences through a sort of filter and make sure that they're only ones that pass your phylogenetic requirements are put into the database and everything else is rejected as a negative. Um, I don't have any evidence for that. I'm just trying to come up with a way that all of this sequencing data is real, that there is a virus back there. It may have been there for years. Um, and now they're just telling us that it's there. And they told us it's there by shooting up a flare in a few places in the world. Um, the other alternative is that the sequencing data is largely incorrect. And I just don't see how that's plausible. Um, so it's it's enticing to just say that you know meta sequencing sucks, but but I, I I think that's a real easy way out. And there are a lot of molecular biologists that have been taking the time to talk to me behind the scenes, and 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 they I think are mostly genuine people trying to help me understand this and themselves understand this as well. And they are also kind of of the uh, a large group of people is kind of under the assumption that all the sequencing can't be wrong. Um, so there's clearly a SARS, SARS-2 coronavirus 
that people are infected with or is present in these PCR tests, at least as they do them. Um, I think the real the real scrutiny needs to be applied to the sequencing now. And if the sequencing really works, like a lot of these molecular biologists tell me, then we have to go back to first principles and saying that every every SARS one suspected case that ended up counting as a case was full genome sequenced. And we have not met that standard in this pandemic by any stretch of the imagination. And that has allowed us to be fooled by the magnitude of the pandemic. And, and now the question is, is why is it that so many people are complacent in the fooling? Um, how, For example, can I ask you a question? How how much does the use of remdesivir figure into your understanding of the the deaths in the pandemic in America? No, I viewed a lot of the deaths were the hospital protocols, like remdesivir yeah, okay, good, and, good, good, and good. the 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 oxygen, whatever you know, yep. that sort of thing. Good, good, good. Because that's part of you know what what goes wrong in the layman's kitchen is that if, if you if you can't get those proportions correct, then it's very easy for the for the layman's imagination to go, yeah, a lot of virus and a little bit of bad ideas, you know, when in reality, there, there can't be a lot of virus. And so it has to be a lot of bad ideas and a little virus. And then you see that the, the, the kind of malfeasance we're chasing is extremely different. It's not, it's not Peter Daysack being a dumb dumb in a laboratory with and funding the wrong lab. That's not how this happened. This is a much larger orchestration of bad choices and and not forced ones that's the scary part it's not forced ones the the people that yeah it's it's i don't want to attribute I, I i fall into that trap a lot of trying to explain what people are thinking or what people are doing or why they're it's bad guys or good guys but you know a year ago we couldn't make that but i think three years we're three years in now we have to scratch our head and wonder why we're doing it still like this there's something very very wrong um, Sin sinister and just to comment on the no virus thing i mean um I, some some listeners right now are going to get angry with me but it's fine I, I get pooped on from all uh directions but i just and, and I, I found that no virus people are the most zealous zealous almost cult like because you, you don't get it from the people who say oh it's a bioweapon or oh, all, all the different scenarios and but the thing that gets me i can believe that i mean covid was not a virus and it was all manufactured okay i can go with that but they have further gone and they throw the baby out with the bathwater, sort of as you say and they say infectious disease never existed pestilence plague uh contagion doesn't exist when i know from my very well experience you know um infectious disease exists and that's the thing where it gets me where guys i mean you've gone too too far you know and, and any thought on, on that yeah that, i i think you summarize it perfectly i think it's it is a and i've been trying to say this on my stream it is a bit of a trap and for some reason um i don't know if they're 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 part of this or not. I don't know how to really think about it, but some of the level of disingenuousness that exists on that side in particular is extraordinary because uh, as I tried to say earlier, although I guess I probably didn't say it very well, but they're very meticulous when it comes to looking at viral papers and pointing out the incongruencies between the control group and the experimental group. But more than a few of these people have pointed to a woman by the name of Veda Austin who takes water from people's bottles and freezes it and then it gives them messages in the form of an image that she can you know show you pictures of and say that water has all this emotional memory <clears throat> these same people who want you to take their scrutiny of virology seriously seem to not apply any scrutiny to some of the other people that they that they co-promote which is so bizarre to me um and so obviously fabricated I, I i don't even know how to say it any other way but but if you if you can dedicate a whole hour to giving a meticulous presentation about how coronavirus 2 was never isolated and that they're missing the proper controls but then pivot almost in a slide to water memory 
and then not mention that Luc Montagnier was working on water memory in a very specific form with reference to DNA delusions, but focus exclusively on this, you know, pictures and images of emotions. It seems so, so patently obvious that there's a game happening here. Um, it's just, I think we might be getting very close to touching the scenery on this theater. And so once we get this close, it doesn't really stand up to scrutiny at all. Whereas maybe in, in the, the, the extent to the illusion here is, is not to be underestimated either. I think everywhere that I've, that I've pushed, um, I've found significant problems, which is one of the reasons why, you know, I slowly got to the stage where, I attributed less and less of the total reality to a virus. And that's that's really how someone should get to the stage where you and I are, I think, is by trying to reverse the equation. Okay, so how many people died of this bad idea? How many people died of this bad idea? How many people would have died of this bad idea? How do they explain these deaths? And then you realize that there's really not very much left except for in specific places with specific symptoms that you need to say well he definitely had something that person definitely had something those five people all had something they were all sequenced they all were this then fine but we cannot underestimate how many people we're being told fell into those very concrete obvious categories of covid disease when in reality they did not most of us have forgotten that that every state had their health health uh, secretary go on TV at some point in 2020 to explain that we're right now, we're counting everybody. And still, Rick Bright went in front of Congress yesterday and said that in America, 1.6 million people have been killed and five some million people around the Western world have been killed, even though he also knows that for the first year and a half, we were counting everyone that was PCR positive when we were only using emergency use authorized PCR tests, which most of which aren't even there anymore, could never be reinvestigated or replicated or invest, uh, looked at in retrospect. They're all gone. Some of those companies don't even exist anymore. And so that part of the narrative has been so scrubbed that it's, it's going to be hard for us to convince some of our more entrapped friends and family to to accept that you know what you know about 3 years ago matters. That's that's a that's a hard bend for for people that can barely pay attention to their bills every month to think remember how they lied to you 3 years ago and then how those lies changed 2 years ago and then how those lies changed a year and a half ago and then those how those lies have changed this year and how they're changing again. That's a really hard narrative to tell. And so that's where we're struggling right now. We're so far away from what those people have come to understand as reality that it, it's a it's an earth shattering distance for some of those people to cross. And so it's very easy to get them to not dare to cross by waving from them on the other side and saying, there's no virus over here. So then they will they they see that and like, well, I can't I can't. I can't deal with that. And I think that's the main effect that these no virus people have is that they they make it very hard for people to start their critical thinking engine without thinking, well, that's obviously wrong. And then, you know, you and I, anybody that labels us as no virus, um, we have this this stigma as well. It's that easy. It's 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 become the the pandemic version of anti-vaccine. Uh, anti-vaxxer is now a no no virus person and the moment that i said this stream that or gave this talk that you said that you cited uh from a couple weeks ago people were saying that i was a no virus guy when i'm not i mean i'm not at all i'm saying it's for sure it has to be if there was a virus it had to come from a lab and it was a clone for sure um i'm just saying that even if it was a clone um, it could never have been responsible for the majority of deaths that we are we are attributing to it. And I think that the people who are running this show are well aware of that, and that's what makes this so malevolent. And I, I, I've just been noticing a trend, though, that's kind of un unnerving, especially for the last couple of years, <laughs> where you get this sort of guilt by association that you're uh, referencing, where you have the QAnon stuff, and then you've got the flat earth stuff. And then you've got no virus stuff and it just and then uh, I'm constantly being flooded with these 
uh, pro-Nazi, anti-Semitic um, people in, in my like Telegram chat, and I'm having to delete it because it seems like someone, people that are getting close to what's really going on, they're trying to throw poop on us to associate, you know, with all of these wacky theories. So then people would not uh, listen to us. So I just, I, I just wanted to point out, there's this unnerving trend. Like I don't, I, I believe QAnon was a you know, intelligence operation. I don't believe in flat earth. I, I don't believe in no virus, but it's just kind of weird. This, this pattern that's, that's uh, starting to appear. And then, you know, any, any final thoughts and uh, the future is, as you said, this is, they're not letting up on this myth, this, this pandemic uh, narrative, the, the, our governments are doubling down. Uh, they're talking about camel flu and the hellhound flu and I don't know what, and you've got the WHO working on this pandemic treaty. Um, and they want to create this, you know, one health stuff like a global digital passport. And they just keep pushing this along. And so just your, your thoughts uh, on the road uh, ahead. Yeah, the road ahead is very, very gray. Um, unfortunately, I think the road ahead and the solutions that I would advocate for often have keywords that I think eventually are going to become flagged. Um, I think one very good possibility would be some independence among the states in America. Um, to prevent a nationwide set of regulations involving IDs and that kind of thing. Um, but I don't know if you're aware, the, the U.S. already has this real ID law in effect so that I think it's in 2023 that everybody in America is going to have to have some kind of RFID chip in their driver's license, which may or may not have information on it to begin with, but it's already there as a possibility. If it's it's a blank notebook on your on your driver's license that they could put your records in in another year once everybody's got one i think that's one of the that's one of the reasons why florida's governor was allowed to be so outspoken and they made such a big public deal of people moving to florida is because when you move to florida you already have a real id in your driver's license because they already adopted it two years ago so i think there's a few tricks that have been played on people and there's there's a few more tricks that are going to be played in the next couple of years. Um, one of the things that I said in 2020 at the transition between Trump and Biden was that they were going to wreck us this year by revealing that the that the elections were fraudulent. And it turned out to be wrong. Um, they did not do that. But I think that's still very possible. And in fact, it would be very interesting for them to do that in light of a Trump or DeSantis loss. And then to reveal that in the end, it turns out that the Biden election was uh, was fraudulent in some way. Um, maybe for national security reasons, they can't reveal that until Biden is no longer president or some nonsense like this. But I do think there is going to be a kind of a kind of of scandal in the American government that will that will permanently put a schism between the TV accepting left and the kind of crazy conspiracy nationalists on the right. And the anybody who tries to take the middle ground will be will be not on TV and you'll never hear it. Um, and they'll see what happens. I, I don't really know, honestly. I think more pain is in, in store. And so um, I think the most important thing for our viewers and our listeners to realize is, is that um, by pursuing an understanding of this, um, you can mitigate some of the stress that will come from not knowing what's going to happen next. All of us are going to be in this continuous state of, you know, unrest and whatever, but to minimize that, you can try and pay attention. You can try and learn the biology. You can try and understand so that you can accurately identify the hyperbole so that you can, you know, s listen to transhumanism without getting sick. Um, and so that you can, you know, engage with your friends and family without immediately feeling enraged or or frustrated or rolling your eyes but instead you can find some space for for sympathy and and um and love because i do think that you know like a a, a friend who might have an abusive spouse um it's not going to do you any good to just say hey you got to divorce him and and that's it you know you're gonna have to be a friend and you're gonna have to listen and you're gonna have to repeat over and over again that there's an alternative um and and i think with our family and friends we're gonna have to keep remembering what happened being able to tell the story when we're when we're asked to um and tell it in such a way that 
continues to plant seeds of doubt in the people that still look to the TV for some comfort and, uh, and hope for the best, right? I mean, we can also try to raise our kids to understand this, which is also very important because, as I said in the beginning or in the middle, I do think the play is really not on us. The play is 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 on our children and the young people. If if only to get them to say, just do it, Dad, you know, just do it. Um, I think that's where we are. And so we've got to make kids understand that convenience is not a good reason to adopt things. Um, we got to make kids understand that taking responsibility for understanding is what adults do. Um, and we've got to make kids understand what informed consent is from a World War II, Nazi, Nuremberg, um, Belmont Report perspective. I think they need to understand the foundation of of Western values is that you have responsibility for your own actions and your own choices, and your freedom is defined on that responsibility. And and kids need to understand that as they go forward so that they become adults that that shoulder that responsibility rather than offload it on Facebook and the TV. I, I think that's a key point you're making that the target, the focus, I think they care less about us middle-aged and, and older folk but it's the the kids and, and from 20 uh i was teaching virtually from the last um my last year of uh, teaching kazakhstan um from 20 late 2020 2021 and the kazakh high school kids um that i was talking with from here th they already busted out you know the the COVID digital app in in, in kazakhstan it's called the ashuk app uh, and back then they couldn't go even go to in the coffee shop in kazakhstan without scanning the qr code and i'm asking them like like, are you okay? Every teen, they saw nothing wrong with it at all. They were totally okay. Um, uh, and I think that's going to what you're saying, that the young people do not question at all the, the, these uh, tech applications or QR codes. And that's the great danger because if 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 it gets accepted by majority with this next generation, we're completely uh, screwed. And oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, and uh, other thoughts, I guess. Yeah, I think we, we covered a lot of ground there. And um, you're, you're banned. Uh, I think you've been banned in a lot of places, Twitter and uh, YouTube. Uh, I think you're on Twitch and, and your website. Where, where are the best places for people to still find you online? Yeah, I'm streaming on Twitch. Twitch hasn't given me any problem. And my Twitch handle is just Gigaohm Biological, one word. And then I also have gigaohmbiological.com, which is just a place where you can find all the stuff. Technically speaking, I'm not banned on YouTube. It's just that if I do my stream on YouTube, it'll get bounced so i still have some of my old videos that are up there which are part of the scooby-doo where i was still riding on my bike saying oh my gosh it's a lab leak it's a lab leak um but i think they're they're a nice historical document that that sort of you know documents really what happened and how it happened and um and and i think i'm still going to be looking back in retrospect on this aspect of our this this time in our lives uh for many years to come it's really you know the chinese have that saying you know may you live in interesting times and dare i say we might be living in the most interesting times in modern history right now and, and so it feels good in a sense because i i think you sense it as well that that when you get when you get the chance and i i have the chance and you obviously have the chance to produce media which which is a vehicle for you to to to, it's almost a therapeutic thing to try and explore reality in this way. And not everybody has the privilege of of making content and talking to people and have people watch it. Um, so I'm really grateful for my audience. I'm really grateful for your audience and your invitation to meet them. Um, and uh, I just hope somehow or another, this form of media, which you are a part of and I am a part of, starts to be dominate the way that that humans share information because i think that decentralization of thinking is what's going to to uh, help us avoid what appears to be a very malignant hive mind that's after us all yeah hopefully the sensors don't uh succeed and we can somehow push forward um all right well uh jay your links will be in the description and uh you keep up the great work and thank you for being on geopolitics and empire Thank you very much, man, for having me. I hope you enjoyed this Geopolitics and Empire podcast. The website is geopoliticsandempire.com, and I encourage you to sign up to the free email list that notifies you of every new podcast and other important updates. The email list and website are our last lines of defense. We're being censored and deplatformed. 
It's almost impossible to find geopolitics and empire on the Google search engine. We've been blacklisted. YouTube frequently strikes videos. Facebook restricts our page. Reddit, Twitter, and LinkedIn take down posts. After the Associated Press mentioned geopolitics and empire in a 2021 article co-written with NATO, or the Atlantic Council, our Patreon account was terminated. Vimeo also terminated our pro account at one point. In April of 2022, the Department of Homeland Security had PayPal ban us for life. The best free way to help geopolitics and empire is to leave a review on Apple Podcasts or elsewhere and subscribe to all of our media channels. You can find the video broadcast now on five platforms, Odyssey, Rockfin, Rumble, BitChute, and Brighteon. You can find the audio broadcast on the entire podcast ecosystem, SoundCloud, Apple, Spotify, and so on. My current favorite social media channels are Twitter and Telegram, but you can also find us on Gab, MeWe, Minds, Float, VK, Instagram, Facebook, and LinkedIn. You can support this guerrilla signal by donating via DonorBox, Buy Me a Coffee, Subscribestar, or Crypto. You can purchase a consultation with the host to talk about expatriation, geopolitics, or podcasting. You can also become a monthly or annual member via Stripe and receive benefits such as partaking in a monthly member Zoom call, get access to a weekly recording of my random thoughts, and a private Telegram channel. Thank you for listening.